are on top of a BERT program now confronted with a COVID recovery program that has to be in place. Before that eight day period, there were a number of things being tossed about publicly concerning what a program might be, what elements might be um, included in a particular proposal. And the trade union movement was generally silent about it because as I said, a proposal was only formally put to us last week, Monday. And uh, when we consider eight days ago and uh, what we have to be presenting to you this morning, I'm satisfied as a leader in the trade union movement that it re represents a marked movement away from where we started and it reflects the benefit of openness, a full consultative process at work, and a willingness to tweak and refine, taking account of the concerns of all interested parties. So last week, Thursday, we had the opportunity as a trade union body more widely, more widely than just the two reps from the NUPW, the BWU, and Setu Sap, we had the opportunity to speak to a number of our leaders who in turn have been speaking to their constituents. Out of that meeting, the Prime Minister proposed that these sessions could be facilitated here at the gymnasium. And Honorable Prime Minister, we want to thank you for the suggestion and for the facilitation because in, the, in a COVID-19 context where we are under so many restrictions, it would be difficult, very difficult for our unions to reach out to as many people as we would wish to. And so these sessions have been organized to facilitate the discussion. I know that there are some trade unions who have um, had engagement with their membership since Thursday. And although allocations of space have been made for some, they might now be open to other people because I am aware that some unions have received majority support already for the program. But this is an opportunity not for me to blabber on too much, but for you who made it out this morning, for you to receive the presentation, for you to have the benefit and the maximum time available to ask as many questions as possible. Of course, the Prime Minister outside of asking for these sessions is the minister responsible for the public service as well. Minister also responsible for finance. So it is useful for us to have the program being rolled out at the highest level of the union leadership and the government. So I'm urging all of us to, as we hear the presentation, to ask as many questions as possible, utilize this as an opportunity for as much clarification as possible and so that the sessions will be meaningful to all of us. So with those brief remarks, um, that's it from me. I want to hear from you. Thank you, Senator. Um, is the gymnasium ready? Well, um, and where has President Mervyn Grace disappeared to? I invite the president of the Police Association, Mervyn Grace, to join the leadership at the head table. Um, well, thanks, Tony, for further putting things in context. Without any further delay from myself, I now invite Prime Minister Honorable Mia Amor Motley to make her presentation.
Thank you very much, um, Mr. O'Neill. Distinguished members of the head table all, distinguished members of the public service in the gymnasium all, uh, many of the faces in this room I recognize, and I'm happy to see many of you. I wish that we were meeting in a different environment from the point of view that COVID-19 has brought a new reality to us. But it is COVID-19 that has equally brought us here. This is a once in a lifetime event. A hundred years ago, you had World War I and you went straight into the Great Depression and you went straight into riots throughout the Caribbean for about five years and straight in thereafter to World War II. After that Second Great War, the march to progress and development started pretty much in the Western Hemisphere, but definitely within our context, where from 1944 on, in particular, we started to see the passage of legislation and the passage of things to improve the condition of the average Barbadian person. And out of that came the development first of political parties and then of the union movement. By the 1950s, the labor legislation as we know it was cemented by Sir Grantley. And in the 1960s, Mr. Barrow added the social security movement, which was started by Grantley and passed by him as we know it. In 1980-81, Tom Adams added to it the absolute necessity that we're now recognizing and we take for granted, but most countries in the world do not have it. And that is the right to unemployment benefit. It is that unemployment benefit framework that has given us the quickest glimpse to what is happening in our country. And that is with over 41,000 applications for unemployment benefit, not people, but applications, we then realize that we have not just a normal problem, but a problem that goes to the heart of stability on an island of 166 square miles. It is fortuitous that the first people with whom we meet this morning are those of you from the law enforcement arm and those of you who, like the medical workers, are the other frontline workers, whether on the border or in the villages, communities, highways and byways of this country. And I refer to you specifically as that because whether in or out of restricted movement, whether in or out of curfew, whether at the borders or catering to Barbadians, you are the ones who are there and will have to be able to see and deal also with the reality of significant increases in unemployment, which we hope to be temporary. But part of the difficulty of this particular virus, like with the Spanish flu a century ago, is not knowing when the therapeutic or the vaccine will come. Barbados is ahead of the curve with respect to testing. We're not ahead of the curve with respect to access to the consumables that we need to even expand testing or with like all other small island developing states, we're now making the case for us to be able to have access to the in vitro diagnostics, or as they call them, the therapeutics, the medicine to cure you, as well as the vaccine to prevent you from getting it. But while we do all of that, we have to keep our country safe. So that this is fundamentally about lives and livelihoods. 
the government recognizes that in spite of the couple hundred million dollars that have been put back in the pockets of Barbadians over the last two years, whether in terms of income tax refunds, reverse tax credits, VAT refunds, corporation tax refunds, CLECO money, um, British American, that there is a genuine concern that if we want to have the greatest impact and multiplier with the money that we spend now, it probably needs to be in capital projects mm -hmm. and to increase significantly the amount of capital projects that we can do, the government can do. It is against that background, therefore, that the government has determined because of the fiscal space that we have, and Dr. Greenwich will carry you through the details of the presentation, that we need to be able to shift some of our expenditure. And believe you me, I'm not an accountant, so understand it above the line and below the line and what you can do. I, like you, had to learn it when I became Minister of Finance with respect to what would be the parameters of per permitted expenditure. So for those who ask, well, why well, does not issue a bond and get money? The issue is not financing. The issue is fiscal space. So that if this is all of the space, and Dr. Greenwich will explain it far better than I could ever, if this is all the fiscal space I have, then all I can do is rearrange within the box what I need to do in order to be able to get the capital expenditure that I need to get. Are we doing other things too? Of course we are. I've indicated already that we're reviewing the estimates, we're reviewing programs. There's some programs we will have to put on hold, there's some we will have to pause, there's some we will have to get rid of and find somebody else to do them. Because we are in that moment and the most important thing, because COVID-19 is a once-in-a-lifetime event, what we don't want is to create permanent solutions that go way beyond what COVID-19 is carrying us to and overshoot. So it is against that background that we determined that a compact with those of us who are at the core of wanting to retain stability in this country and, and there is no God-given right to stability, and if we ever doubted it, we only need to go and turn on our television now and watch for the last seven days what has been taking place in the United States of America and which nobody can be happy about, but which, regrettably, is as a result of years of ignoring the concerns, the difficulties, the worries, the anxieties, and not just of who we see, because in very many instances, the people we are seeing on television are our family. And in many instances, there are some who even have linkages literally to Caribbean families or are Caribbean by birth. So that we know that there is no God-given right to stability. And therefore, fundamentally, this program is about being our brother's keeper and our sister's keeper and ensuring that all must eat in this country going forward over the next 18 months or so. Why? Because the few that are not will put the entire society at risk if we have pockets who cannot live well in this country of ours. Now, what we put on the table, as both Mr. O'Neill and Senator Moore said, have been tweaked, has been tweaked significantly through collaboration and communication with the union movement, with the officers in the Ministry of Finance, with other public servants, and also with others outside of the fray here who have made a considerable difference such that, as I said on Thursday, Barbadian ingenuity is creating an opportunity that is potentially a win-win. A win-win for the government in terms of the capital works program that we need to undertake so that more Barbadians can get work. 
significantly more Barbadians can get work over the course of the next 12 to 18 months than would otherwise be able to. A win-win for you because there's no alteration to your compensation in any way and you can opt in, opt out, opt in fully, opt in partially, opt out fully, opt out partially. Um, a win-win for those who are going to help us ensure that you can opt in and opt out, namely the credit union movement or individuals who may have more liquidity than others in or out of the system, working or not working as pensioners because we've had all kinds of people ask us if they can participate. And a win-win for the goal that we set ourselves as a nation, which we have not yet reached regrettably, and that is the goal of economic enfranchisement. In the late 1970s, tax incentives were put in place to fuel the credit union movement, a movement that had barely hundreds of millions of dollars, now has over $2.4 billion. But the $2.4 billion is deposited in the banking system with rates of return of 0.1 and 0.01%. And therefore, this represents a distinct opportunity for them to be able to do so. The last point I'd make is and relates to the question of concern that some of you may have. We've already indicated that in the same way, this government recognized that the savings bonds were an attempt by Barbadians to be able to help the last government in bridging the gap we deliberately excluded the savings bonds from restructuring when we restructured the debt of the government of Barbados. And we have already committed that these bonds here will be insulated should there be some kind of catastrophic global event of which we are not aware. Um, but should that event ever happen, then these bonds are to be insulated from that occurrence. I've set out that briefly, but we'll hand over to Dr. Greenwich. Um, I asked for this meeting, these meetings, last Thursday. And I asked for them because I felt that if we were asking you to do something, then from the very highest level of government, we had to be prepared to come and ask you and not to hide and send a message because that is not the Barbadian way and it is against that background that I'm here. Um, my political career and my career in public life and some of you know because I was in the law courts with many of you that I see in this room but it started at a time when the country, yes, sent home 4,500 people, and yes, had a pay cut of 8%. We objected then, and I still fundamentally feel that a pay cut must never be the first option. And that is why, in the last two years, my government chose to do that which no other government in the history of this country had ever done to choose to make the adjustment on capital and not on labor. Regrettably, in every previous occasion, labor was on the front line of the adjustment. In 1974, in 1981, in 1991, in 2013. And we took a decision that labor must not be on the front line on that occasion. And as compared to billions of dollars of readjustment for capital, who, by the way, were able within a year to be posting profits again, in spite of all of the protestations, with respect to labor, the adjustment in the first 18 months was the $28 million as a result of the 1,000 or so persons that regrettably lost their jobs. On this occasion, the adjustment is not with you with respect to any adjustment of jobs or any adjustment of salary. But it is an adjustment of how we do things 
availing an opportunity or allowing you to avail yourself of an opportunity that would not otherwise exist. Um, and why? Because we are our brothers, sisters, and keepers. And all of us from small learn one thing. There but for the grace of God goes I. And I trust and pray that this country will always hold dearly to that precept that recognizes that on 166 square miles, you cannot live as an island. You have to live in solidarity with each other. So against that background, I'd like to thank you. Um, I'm told that we have six of these meetings um, over the next two days, and I also have a ACP summit tomorrow morning at six o'clock um, in across the oceans. So I feel as though I'm on a path for two days, but I feel that this is the most essential conversation that I must have as Prime Minister of this country in COVID-19. Because at the end of the day, if we do not have agreement on most of us moving in the same direction, then what is at risk is ultimately the stability of this fair nation of ours. I trust and pray that we share the same philosophy and the same perspective to the development of our nation and to the opportunities to protect those who are most vulnerable, but also to protect and create a platform for our children coming, because a platform cannot be built on sandy ground. It can only be built on a solid foundation. And it is up to us who are the wicked now, pardon the mixture of metaphors, but it is up to us who are the wicked now to lay the foundation for those who are coming. Thank you. I look forward to answering your questions in this session. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. Good morning to everyone. Um, Prime Minister, they look quite clearly the context of the program and indeed went over some of the salient features of the program. So all that remains for me to do is dive right in and get into the details and hopefully bring clarity to what is being presented and then we can follow with some questions. So in order to have that, I'm gonna, I'll be doing it via Zoom also, so I'm gonna share my screen so you can see um, there on the screen, should we just see it? Um, Just one moment. Um, it is my information that this session is being streamed um, or Zoomed. Uh, just good. Okay. Um, Dr. Greenwich, be aware. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Don't, don't worry. I'm not going to say anything that time. <laughs> nah, I'm aware. Thank you very much. I keep, I say good words. <laughs> All right. So let's begin. Barbara's Optional Savings Scheme. Um, which we now know as BOSS. And it is truly um, a combination of work shared between ourselves, the union, and with any great product, I was telling someone the other day, with any great product, any economic great product, any great plan, the first one is not always the best. It goes through a stage, it's a refinement. And what comes on the other end really sometimes amazes persons. It is really one of those really good products. Now, perhaps let me begin by saying, as Prime Minister pointed out, but in more detail, why? Why now? Why are we doing this at this moment? In one word, COVID. The impact of COVID. At the beginning of, at the end of the last fiscal year in March, we were projecting, or we are, uh, it was late in Parliament, our revenues, expectations, on our expenditures, our budget. We were on track as with the BERT program. Along came COVID, and our best estimates today is that government stands to lose in the region of 450 to 500 million dollars in revenues. And I must say that's our current work estimate because it really depends on how long this external shock COVID lasts, how quickly we are able, the world opened up because a lot, when you're a tourism dependent country, a lot is outside of your control. When the world opens up, 
uh, flights begin. Rethinking any year carefully, but it could be next year, early next year. It depends on how long. And the other part I show you there is that so the shot on, um, on uh, revenue could be much larger. But right now, 450 to 500. With that in mind, at the same time, government needed and did indeed at the end of March began to step up its expansion as every government in the world did to deal with the COVID effect. Starting, you know, about the we, um, preparing quarantine centers at Harrison Point, refurbishing and outfitting the polyclinics, um, stocking up on medications for uh, and medical supplies, test equipment, kits, kits etc. That happened already and that was a necessary expenditure. And at the same time, as the, the, the pandemic really took root across the world, and many borders and many countries went on lockdown, including Barbados, we find that you had to then, government then start to put in measures in place to mediate the impact of COVID and the rest of the economy. So you saw through its so -so survival program, another 45 million or so was allocated to that, which included an increase of 40% in the wealth, um, the, the amount of assistance coming from the welfare department to its clientele. You see $600 coming to the most 2,000 vulnerable families. Um, we, we implemented the Adopt the Family um, program where we take care of brothers and sisters and persons get funding through that. And at the same time, continue to support the NAS and indeed working now to provide NAS for additional liquidity. And that's just a necessary expenditures on the whole so part, but also making provisions for businesses uh, to survive and continue because in any economic recession, what you don't want is for businesses to sh totally shut down. They could go at most on slow pace, and sh but they want to be in a position that when the world is open uh, and they're re ready, they are ready to take off. And you found, you see things like the $200 million tourism facility which allow hotels to take this opportunity to refurbish and to get their product up and ready to go in. They got a 40 million VAT program. Um, even providing $1,500 per month to self-employed persons who would not otherwise have access to funds at this moment. So a necessary step up in terms of expenditure to the tune of 1% to 1.5% of GDP. However, with all best intentions, you continue to see the follow as the Prime Minister indicated in terms of NAS claims. So for 40,000, 41,000 claims, which if we do some extrapolation, that's about a third of the workforce, it will tell us, are now unemployed. So it's necessary for government also to use what it can do, especially to mop up some of those jobs. And one area in which what the best way to do that is to bring forward where possible your, your cap, government capitals program um, in order to provide employment and expand that program in areas to generate jobs, particularly in areas that don't necessarily depend on tourism. So the refurbishment from a business like painting and fixed up government buildings and schools. What about road repairs where you don't depend on tourism directly and you can still up, uh, um, adhere to the protocols of health um, to be, remain safe? Um, refurbishing the markets, the fish markets, the vendor stalls, etc. Uh, embarking on overall environmental clean park program. If that can, you can do that, that is a very good way to help mop up some of that um, unemployment that we see at the moment. Now, to do that, government needs an additional, apart from the things I've already spoke about, an additional 100 to 110 million dollars in fiscal space, which the Prime Minister alluded to. And, um, I've presented this a number of times to unions, different persons. The question always comes up, what is, really, what is fiscal space? What do we talk about? Prime Minister um, indicated, uh, why not just float a bond there, the entire um, Barbados? Or why not just borrow some money from somewhere? You know, there's a difference between fiscal space and financing. And the best analogy you can put is imagine you have a 40-foot container. And in that 40-foot container, everything you want to spend or can spend is in there. In, in your case, it might be your mortgage, your, 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 your car loan, food, funds for the support for anybody you need to support itself. For government, it is the current expenses with your wages, government wages, it's, it goes and service expenses, it computing equipment, etc. cetera. Um, in there, you've got the payment on your past debt, the interest payments, etc. cetera, any transfer, everything is in there, the capital. And imagine that's your 40 foot container. You, that's our fiscal space. How we got that fiscal space? Well, on one hand, the revenues are strengthened tremendously. On the other hand, you don't want to go 
and the worst thing a government can do is become, I don't want to use the word careless, but I don't know the best word, with its fiscal position. You remember, prior to this, we implemented the BERT program in the beginning of, um, two years in, in effect right now. And one of the problems we had with the fiscal, which was totally unsustainable. Government wasn't paying it bills on time, had mounted a raise to about $1.9 billion in arrears and supplies, and et cetera. Um, and averaging fiscal deficit of 7%, an unsustainable position. So through the BERT program, we have fixed government finances. We've paid down the arrears now to we only owe about just a bit more than 200 million, 200 million in arrears. Um, we're paying bills on time. And now we're running small surpluses and primary balances of 6% that we can pay down there. So you don't want, when a temporary shock hit you, to go and just wipe, get killers with your fiscal, and then when the world opens up, you're in a position where you're catching your tail, you know what to do. You can see that all right, catching your tail. Hmm. You understand what I'm saying? So you lost your revenues, your, your expenditures a certain way, that determines your fiscal space. And in fact, we widened, the, we had a, Let's say we had a, four, a 20 foot container, we write it to 40 feet because we discussed with IMF and we said saving 6% primary, we reduce the one and let the character balance if things worsen. So that's a 40 foot container a space. Now, finance, imagine you were the Bill Gates of the world, you're the Bill Gates of Bill Gates. you got all the money in the world. The only restriction you could only spend work could go in that container. So why? You don't have, a, you don't have a, um, a finance problem, right? You have a space. A fiscal space problem. So for us now to increase the capital, which is part of the container, we need to save something on somewhere else. We look across Premier in We look at what we're spending money. We look at repurposing the, the 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 budget in terms of what is necessary and trying to target it more purposely. We're also looking at wages. Now, because everything going by container is recorded on a cash basis, if I pay cash, is in there. If I don't pay cash, it's not in there. So when I pay, when we pay workers. Their money, and last year, let me tell you, the wage bill was what? In central government, 806 million. I don't remember it for, for the rest of my life because I lost a bet to the Prime Minister on that. Cost me two bottles of whiskey. But anyhow, let me not put that over there. Now, 806 million, that's cash spent. That is in my container, you understand? Now, if I could shave off a bit of that, I mean in government, by giving workers a bond, so you're not worse off. But I don't record it and they put the bond in the debt bucket, in the debt container. That's an expense for later. So I take out, say, 10% of the wages, so maybe I reduce it by 100 million. All of a sudden, I have a bit of space that I can channel into the capital. You follow me? So when if a person says, why don't I give it to, a bond to everyone in the country? Well, everyone is not in my fiscal space. So therefore, paying them a bond doesn't help me. It gives me money, but I'm Bill Gates the world. I have all the money I want. Truly, we don't have all the money we want, but we are in a good financial position. Let me make it clear. If you recall, at the beginning of the program, we had $420 million in reserves. I tell people sometimes, two things are coming, we can pack a biscuits and we did. In fact, seriously, we could not have withstood COVID impact now with that, because we expect to lose almost four, Six, seven hundred million dollars in reserves this year. But the good thing is that at the end, of, we now stand at 1.7 billion dollars in reserves. Tomorrow, we go to the MF board with our fourth review of our BERT program. And all the indications want that is passed. We will get another 49 million US dollars because that's part of the program support. And another 90 million US dollars because of the COVID impact. Most countries are taking out real space and get to help us. That will put us what? That's 100. My mask, right? 140 million in all? 49. 49, and that's what? 300 million, roughly, by base dollars. That added to the 1.7, 2 billion dollars. So it's not an issue of that we don't have the reserves to help us. So much so we may not put all in the reserves. We may put some for work. So I'm not saying that we have the Bill Gates behind here, but we, have, we don't have right now a financing problem. We have a fiscal problem. So that's to make it clear. So this is the program, is it? So this program then. It's designed to achieve two objectives. On one hand, create fiscal space, and explain how it, by offering workers part of their salary in a bond, and I say this is net salary after tax and it has come out, is your pay take home, instead of taking home all the cash, you take home a small portion in bond. So the first truth is your salary remains intact. It's, there's no cut. But if you can afford to take that bond, then that bond frees up 
in my container the space that I can now spend on expenditure. So I achieve your objective of creating $100 million in fiscal space, depending on it. And I will explain later to you why it's truly optional, because there's no bias or incentive either way except to get you to save, because it's been so well designed with everyone input that even when person opts opt out, we still get the fiscal space. So there's no incentive beyond explaining to you and showing you if you can truly afford to save, this is the best opportunity available right now. Uh, the other objective is what? I reduce my, faith, my wage bill in terms of cash spending, but I don't cut employment in the public sector. So we achieve that dual goal. Any, and everything we evaluate, keep in mind, it must attain these two objectives when we, in, in terms of the program. The other beautiful thing that it here is the Belgian principle of taking care of a brother. Because when we spend money, as the Prime Minister explained, especially on capital, our fellow know who lost his pay in the hotel because the hotel has gone out of business or slowed down because of COVID, can now get a piece of work in the construction when we start there. Or can his community help pay at the school or help refurbish one government building? So we are so cannot employment, uh, unemployment and helping our brothers and sisters in the Beijing area. So we are, we, these are the key principles of the program. Now, graphically, I you know we all picture, so let me just I put a graph here to explain a picture. On one hand, this is what exists before. You get your full salary, one truth for the program, your full salary. You used to get it as a cash in check, you get it in your, your bank account in Broad Street, your credit union, however you used to get it, you used to get it that. Now we are proposing that for the next 18 months, you will get your full salary again, the same way, but this time, each month you will get peace, the majority say 90%, I will give you the actual amount soon, as check, cash in your bank account in Broad Street, in the bank, in the credit union, wherever you, you, you bank. But at the same time, you will also get a bond, the last portion of your check. So if 95% was cash, the 5% is a bond. That is yours in your bond account. You got a bank account, it becomes your bond account. And saying that government holding to give you later is yours in your bond account. You can do whatever you want, do it with it. You can will, you can will it, bequest it, use it to support collateral for a loan. You can cash it in. Whatever you so desire, it is yours. That's the, that's how it works. So let me talk about this bond. And a lot of persons asked before was a bond. This bond is a instrument which you will now get as part of your salary that you opt for. It will earn you 5% each year for four years. It means if you save $1,000 of your salary now, I'm going to take you some examples and numbers, but if you were supposed to save $1,000, 5% of that is $50. So every year you will get $50 for the next four years, which is $200. Now, if you put that thousand in bank, well, you probably at zero point one percent, you get a dollar and fifteen cents at, at the end of the year. If my math is correct, is it correct? Fifteen? No, you get fifteen cents. Sorry, on that thousand. You see the difference. Now, to make it even more attractive, the bond will pay interest every six months, so you don't have to wait the end of the four years to get your interest. You will get so that fifty dollars, you will get twenty five dollars in six months. Another twenty five in the next six months, and another twenty five. So at the end of four years, you got your two hundred dollars back, and then you get back the bond as cash in your bank account. That's how it works here. To make it even more attractive, government is waiving on the interest earned. The two hundred just mentioned, there be no withholding tax. Now, if you invest your money in the credit union, put it in deposit in the commercial bank, buy a mutual fund, anything. The interest earned on that attracts a tax. We call it a withholding tax. Even before you get it, it comes out. Even on your, your bank statement, correct, you will see it. There will be no withholding tax. So that $200 I mentioned, tax-free in your pocket. It's fully tradable, one, because on one hand, it comes in 18 pieces. Every month you put down a piece, that goes in your bond account. That's one bond in July. If we start in July, and that's the objective, in August, another piece goes in your bank account, in your bond account. That two pieces, you have two bonds. So because at the end of 18 months, you got 18 pieces, fully tradable, you take out whichever you want, the one that went in first, number two, you could do number 10, you could do whatever you want. At the same time, on the back end, they, we, there's a, 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 we are creating an environment where the demand for the bonds are there. Credit unions have expressed that they're on board, 
They, will, they, 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 they have expressed their interest in Central Bank and will be doing it over the next couple of days in terms of how much. But truth be told, financial institutions, anyone, will be, most people be looking for it because there's nothing really else except put your money in the bank or put it on your bed. And you're earning nothing. So it's fully, fully treble. And as the Prime Minister indicated, this bond is immune from, will be immune from any possible restructuring because, as for last time, saving bonds were immune from restructuring. Now, I don't want anybody, anyone with any earshot of my voice to think that, rethinking that you'll be restructuring again. Because that is, in my view, not possible for a number of reasons. One, when we did the last debt restructuring, of about $12 billion, the savings we got, which is about a billion per year, we wrote, we wrote into, we wrote into the, the causes of those new instruments that if we ever had to restructure, all oh, then savings got paid back. So that is something that I can't even phantom. So that, impos that is not possible on that front. And also, more importantly, the reason why we restructured because we, the economy was basically destroyed does not exist today. What I sometimes refer to start to call the four horsemen of economic apocalypse. You know the four horsemen in the biblical terms? But the four horsemen of economics we have fixed. The first horsemen of economics I referred to earlier is debt. Before the start of the BERT program, our debt was 176% of GDP. We were the third debt country, indebted country in the world, so small Barbados. What that meant in layman terms is that 65 cents on average of every tax dollar went to pay a debt. 67. 67, Prime Minister correct me. I got a lot of numbers for them, but hey, but Prime Minister don't forget numbers. 67 cents. That left what? 33 cents to do everything else. Pay wages, buy goods and services, do capital work. So that's why you find there was an absence of any real infrastructure development because there weren't literally any money with all best intention to do anything. Since that, that horseman of the apocalypse, economic apocalypse, and I've coined these phrases, it's now, before the, before the COVID hit us, 118% of GDP are in March. Tra translate what that really means. Now, 22 cents instead of 67 of every tax dollar is paying debt, leaving, what, 78 cents to do the other things that needs to be done. This is why I call it fundamentals. That is like your heart, your blood pressure. If your blood pressure high, and a shot hit you, as COVID hit us, you can't respond. That's your fundamental. You're likely to respond better and recover when your fundamentals is put, uh, put, uh, your, your pressure is down. Another horseman that you apocalypse, reserves. I mentioned it before. Reserves that your blood run through you. So if you've got cholesterol and clotting, you know when COVID hit you and you fall down, it can be difficult to get it back up. Same thing. Reserves were 420 million. I mentioned it. I'd like to repeat. It now starts at 1.7 billion. I'd like you to go to 2 billion. We'll go to 2 billion in excess of 20 weeks. So that horseman of the apocalypse economics has been fixed. It means that that, that fundamental number two, 21 weeks roughly, that, uh, that fundamental. No, no. You're already at 21. But if you have more, you can go up by another four or five. Four or five weeks. So already at 21 weeks, but Minister is correcting me. Remember numbers better than I do, trust me. And another three or four weeks, because of what we will get on Wednesday, will take us about 25 weeks. We've never had that amount, which is important in the history of Barbados. Never. So not COVID hit us, that fundamental, that your blood pressure, that was, I thought cholesterol was good, you are really ready to, to recover better. The third horseman, and it's painted because I want people to understand this, yeah? Of the economic apocalypse is the fiscal, I mentioned that. The fiscal is like you diabetes sugar. High blood pressure, cholesterol sugar. Sugar, you can't mix it. Diabetes is, um, is the fiscal. That is where everything kind of, you know, you got the, everything happened from there. Same thing. Beginning the program, our fiscal position was averaging between those and eight. We ran deficit averaging 7% of, of, um, of, of GDP. Deficits. Deficits. Which means that your revenues was. was much less than expenditure every year to the tune of 7%. And when your money is less than, when any of us money in tear is less than we spend, what you gotta do, you gotta get from say, bar it, your girlfriend, boyfriend, help you out, or you, you, you just want that. You can't pay your bills. So we saw the escalation of, of various water businesses and tax and people complaining and can't get anything to the tune of 1.9 billion. Arrears, paying, arrears become the way you pay your bills, or I pay you later. We have fixed that horseman of the apocalypse of economics. 
Now we're running small surpluses and primary balances of 6% to help us pay down debt later, as we pay down debt every month. So once that is, a, you know, you cut your, your sugar under control, your, your cholesterol under control, you don't have no cholesterol, you don't have no high blood pressure, COVID hit you, you get thrown down for a little bit. We are thrown down now, if that is such a word. <laughs> but you will get back up. The trick is a temporary shot, the trick is to hold force, hold tight to the fundamentals. Don't worse. That's why we, we say the 40 foot container fiscal space, we're going to try to live within that for now because we don't want to on the, on move, destroy the fundamentals. So, with those fundamentals in check, this is why Moody's now very recently said to Barbados, when it gave us a review, they didn't downgrade us, not upgrade us. In the last review, it said, oh, well, it's stable. Well, many countries are downgraded because it, it, you know what a crisis does? What a crisis does? It reveals the weaknesses in the system. When your fundamentals ain't good, and you walk about high cholesterol and, and high blood pressure and maybe diabetes, you're good. But less something happen and core hit you, then you're not so good. And this is why we, so that's why I say, even though I say the bonds are protected for restructuring, I don't want anybody to think that we're thinking about any restructuring or anything going forward, okay? And the final point about the bonds is that they can be redeemed after two years. Government stands ready to take out the bonds for anyone who wants to sell them after two years. But that is not to say you can trade them any time, any day, between now and four years, the bond mature if you want. So let me give you some examples of what I'm talking about. But first of all, the ratios. Any person earning between less than 36,000 a year, this net, after NAS and tax come out, okay? And we're not talking about your allowances here, we're talking about your base salary. You will get 93% of yours. But what is it? First of all, this means 3,000 per month. Then we get down to month net. You will get 93% of that in cash and 7% as a bond. Sorry, be, be, let me say, below the 3,000, you get everything in cash. Everything in cash. However, and the reason why we recognize that lower levels of income, you let you spend more and more on your normal monthly expenses. But however, if a person wants to save in bonds, if the opportunity, the opportunity is offering now, they can indicate, skipper, government, get $200 a month and give me in bonds. So they have that opportunity to do that. Now between 36,000 a year and 50,000 a year, or between 3,000 a month and $4,166 a month, you will get 93% of your salary as cash and 7% as a bond. You can opt for less. This is why it's true the option. You can say, give me 0%, and you I want all my cash. Give me five, give me three. Between 50,000 and 100,000, which is between $4,166 a month at $8,333 a month, you'll get 88% of your salary as cash and 12% as this interest earning bond. Again, you can opt for less. You can opt for no bonds. It's really your choice. And between a thousand, hundred thousand dollars in excess of that, which is really in excess of eight thousand um, three hundred thirty-three dollars a month, you get eighty-three percent of your salary as cash, and you remain in seventy percent as a bond. And again, as with all other levels, you can opt for less, you can opt for half, whatever. You could change every month. Now, let me give you some examples. Um, I see it, it's cut. So let me focus on the Z1 skill here, or maybe Z4. Let's say a person annual gross is $48,756. They're in this skill per month. Um, and, and by the way, even if you don't get to take these numbers, your union, union um, leaders, everyone have copies of this presentation, so you can always get it later. It's totally available, fully there for everyone. Um, that would mean that your monthly take-home salary, net of taxes and uh, NAS, is $3,997.09 a month. That's what you take home in February, in March, in April. You take it home last month, and you will take it home in June. But then come July, and the program kicks in full effect, you take home for the month, it's still that. But now you take home 93% because you're in the category that attracts 7% in bonds. You take home $3,159.29 in cash. So uh, instructions come from the treasury, you'll see in your bank account in Broad Street or your credit union account, you $3,159. That's 93% of your salary. 
At the same time, you will get a bond in your bond account at the central bank and a statement to that effect saying you now own in your bond account a bond to the tune of $237.80. So again, you get your full salary, but you get two sources of income coming to you, two sources of which is paid. From the treasury, you 93%, 3,159.29. And then your bond account is increased by $237. Now, that's July. That's one bond. That bond will now mature four years from now and pay you interest every six months thereof. In August, let's say you haven't changed your instructions, same thing happened. You got two bonds in the central bank to the tune of $500 and what, $64 and $75.60. Two bonds, your bond account increase. And that continues in, in, in September, you put in another bond. And that happens and have continue like that until the end of the program, which you're contributing, you're getting your salary and bonds for 18 months. At the end of 18 months, and they're just gonna show you the savings benefit first, and then we'll talk about the other options. You will have saved $4,280 and 33 cents in your bond account by saving 237 a month. That is paying interest every six months from the collection of bonds in there. This is interest flows. But what I focus on is at the end of four years, that 4283 that you have saved will have attracted interest. Total interest you earn is $856.07. Now, imagine you have put that same every month, the 237 in your bank account and save it. Because the bank rates now is 0.15% or average of 0.1%, you probably get about $25.68 on that as interest. But unfortunately, you ain't getting the ticket out because bank charges. $5 a month for your maintenance fee on your account will bring you, you owe the bank again, they're about $214. I have, I have not even considered that you might go to the counter and over counter transaction and try a $3 fee, sometimes in between there, or you might use another. Oh, the bottom screen cut off. Oh, there. All right. And that you may make. You know, you can always improvise very quickly. We plan for that. Take you straight to the Excel sheet. can't see that. No, we fix it up. I want people to really follow. Can you know where we make it? Yeah, what happened here? Sorry for what I realized that it was cut off. In fact, let me um, do this. Good. Um, collapse. Make it a little bigger. Get some time to refresh. 4500, person can see that now. Make it a little bigger. Good. You can see now? Right. So this is what we're showing on the PowerPoint. And if I come down and you have put it in your bank, you will have saved $25.68. But the bank charges, because the bank is charging $5 a month, you pay bank $240. So you never take out the amount you put in. You will not take out the four. You actually pay, you take out less, you pay the bank to keep your money. <laughs> but if you put it in the bonds, you get $855.56.07. Simply on saving $237 a month. So in terms of a savings opportunity or instrument, this is a no-brainer. So what we really have to care, and, I, and you have all the other examples there, we can, I can go through them for you, but um, to left time for discussions, let me get to assume that everyone understands the example. If you don't, we'll go through it in question and answer. It's really, we have to really, we have to cater for the person who, for one reason or another, cannot afford to save anything. That person, would like to save, but he needs his full cash now. Maybe later he would change the instructions. Assume it's this same individual, uh, Mary, Mary Jane. Uh, Mary Jane gets pays three thousand three hundred ninety-seven dollars and nine cents. The same example. You person can see it right per month. <clears throat> now Mary Jane is entitled to get ninety-three percent, which is three thousand one fifty-nine in cash, and the two two thirty-seven eighty as a bond. <clears throat> Mary Jane cannot afford that right now because she has a few mortgage payments and car loan coming out, maybe in six months' time. 
What will happen is that at the beginning, sometime before the 10th of July, each public servant will be given a form coming from the Ministry of Public Service with a very simple question. This is your bond allocation. Do you want it all in cash? Do you want some in bond? Or do you want all in bond? Let's say Mary Jane want all she money in bond. You know when she says, this is my money, my wife, no. I got some things to do, I can't save nothing. So she wants you 397, okay? That's perfectly fine. Perfectly fine. What happens at the Ministry of Public Service sends instructions to the Treasury to pay Mary Jane her 3159.59 in cash. That goes into her bank account. So Mary Jane got her 93%. At the same time, the Ministry of Public Service sends instructions to the central bank to credit Mary Jane a bank bond account with the 237.80 and then sell it and send the cash to her. But to make sure it's even more seamlessly, central bank, before they even talk about selling, central bank actually buys the bond immediately. So by the time Mary Jane and send the account, money to Mary Jane account in Broad Street. So by the time Mary Jane is looking at her bank account, she's going to see two sources of income adding up to her first salary. She will see the 3, 3, 97, 0, 9, uh, sorry, the, two, the 3, 1, 59, 20, 9, that comes from the Treasury, and she will see the 237 dollars 80 coming from the central bank, and she has her full paycheck. She has a statement from the Treasury indicating how it's divided, and she gets a statement from the central bank saying, you have bonds to this amount, and we can cash it and send you money. Mary again, you get her money one time. Now, let me explain why I'm saying there's no incentive to act for me to anyway, not to adhere or give Mary Jane this full option. Because we still achieve the fiscal objective, full transparency. What have I done as a fiscal authority? What has the government done in this Mary Jane example? The government has paid Mary Jane $3,159.29 in cash. That's in 93%. Remember my fiscal container? What have I recorded? Only that portion. Who has the other, the other 7%? The central bank has picked up the other 7% and turned around and said to a Beijing, a local person, a, a credit union or financial institution who wants to hold the bond. So I still don't record the bond in my fiscal space. Agree? So I still get the fiscal space. That is the beauty of the design. I still get the fiscal space and I can still honor Mary Jane's request instantaneously. So there's no reason, there's nothing, there's nothing for me to even biasly try to say, Mary Jane, Mike, try your best, hold on to these. The only reason you can tell Mary Jane try to hold on to these is because once she's let her go, I know the demand out there, they ain't finding them so easy. Other people looking to invest in them, so it's a great saving opportunity. Let me go through this again, a slightly different one. Let's say Mary Jane says, look, I could only save, I suppose to get 237 in the bond. Truth be told, at the start, let me put 100. I need the one to return because I got to do make my other expenses. In the form, before the 10th of July, Mary Jane instruct, listen, Mary Jane says, I want to save only 100 in my bond account. I only want 100 in bonds, give me rest in cash. No problem. Ministry of Public Service sent instructions to the Treasury saying, pay Mary Jane how much? 3,159.29 in cash. That's all going in my fiscal bucket. My space. It tells the central bank, credit me a general account for 237.80 and sell 137.80, so she only got 100 million, and give her the cash. Central bank immediately converts that, bam, Mary Jane gets her bank account. So she gets two sources of income now. She gets from the treasury again the 3,159.29, and then she gets the 137.80 from the central bank as cash. And she also got a statement from the central bank saying, your bank account had 237.80. We, we give you cash of one thirty-seven eighty. Your bank account now has a hundred dollars, and of course, if you keep it there every month, you will earn uh, five percent on, 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 on that for the next four years, every year. And Mary Jane next month can say, "Well, look, I think this is looking good. Give me full two. Give me full two thirty-seven in bonds. That's no problem. We will continue with that. So, for that perspective, it's fully optional." There's no incentive to do it any other ways. And that is, this whole idea came out, as I say, as back and forth, and tweet and tweet, with discussion with your union representative, everyone. So that's the example. Um, uh, we can talk about later if you have any other questions. Um, so it's fully convertible. Let me just point out two other points. 
that institutions, the, we have discussion credit unions, they are fully on board. In fact, if you are listening to Barstats stats the other day, when I was on there and the, the, the head of credit union indicated that they, will, they are willing to take your bond. If you don't want to encash at the same time via this thing, let's bro, so you want to take it, you can take it to your credit union. Now they will take your bond and cash it and put it against anything you want to put against in your account. Why is that a good deal for you and the credit union? Because the credit union now has to invest the money that you deposit them somewhere. And the only way to put it now is in the bank. All roads lead to the bank. And don't fault anyone. That's the environment. Even if you can't, we'll say, Bobby, you're going to get much more. <coughs> now, the credit, so the credit union invests in 5% instrument by taking it from you. Their revenues are enhanced. Shares improve. Dividends to the credit union member improve. A win win. The, um, you can sell it to an individual, your aunt, your uncle, your brother, your sister. All you do is download it from the central bank, you, you change the title, both persons fill it out, your priest notify it because you don't want you to be under duress when you sign it, or a notary public, and you upload it, bam, finish. Let me just say one thing about the interest rate. It's very attractive, but here's it. It's not out of sync. At least anybody thinks so. Right now, the last, we get loans from multilateral corporate developments at the CDB. Carbon Development Bank, IDB, and thing. The last loan we got from CDB was at 4.25%. 4 4.5%. 4.5%. 4.5%. 4 right? Um, the bond that we structured was 6%. So what we are doing is instead of paying uh, uh, someone else, we are passing all the savings to your worker. It's not all the same. Um, I think that's it for now. I will start here and then we can move into questions. Thank you okay. very much. You were, okay. If I may, I, I, um, just to say that the CDB bond started at four and a half percent, and but because it's a variable rate bond, it's at four and a quarter percent. What you're getting from the government of Barbados is a fixed rate bond, so it is five percent fixed for the life of the bond. People ask why not the whole country? Why we're not making it available to the whole country? Other things and other instruments will come to be made available, and maybe not even at the same level as this, because really and truly, an employer treats employees better than they treat anyone else for the most part. And that is why banks tend to give their employees a mortgage rate that is lower than what you and I who, don't, who are not employed by the bank is paid. Um, having said that, Dr. Greenwich has shown you that this is definitely within the parameters um, of what government will pay to borrow, 4.5% to the two CDB loans in 2018 and 2019. For the external debt restructuring, which finished in December, the two bonds there are 6.5%, but that's really because of different circumstances and much, much, much longer tenor. Um, in other words, a much longer time to repay. So you will find that shorter term debt tends to have lower interest rates and longer term debt tends to have longer ones um, in our part. Um, I want to open the floor to questions and Edwin, if you don't mind, I'm going to chair the questions because it's just we're conscious that time is of the essence, and if we want to get in everybody in each of the three sessions as far as possible, that we try to be able to deal with that, if you don't mind. Uh, very well, Madam Prime Minister, but uh, except to warn that we had some predetermined arrangements. Now, for your, you and Dr. Greenwich's information and the information of the general body, Apart from you who are here, we have another 96 persons on Zoom, 100 on YouTube, and 610 on Facebook. And we had made arrangements that interspersed with questions from the floor that at a predetermined pre or prearranged signal, um, we would entertain those who are on the electronic platforms. You are ready? Uh, with your permission, you can take a question from the um, Zoom people. 
Um, we start here and then and we then get the ones okay. from the Zoom. Anyone here um, wants any clarity or Sergeant Blackman? You want to use the mic so that everyone, yes, thank you. Don't kill me if I don't remember everybody's name. Good morning, um, Prime Minister and members of the high table. Uh, generally, I believe that I grasp the, the concept of the whole uh, BOSS program. Um, process for in forming the central bank. So I, 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 I'm, I'm trying to follow the example of the, the Mary Jane uh, as the employee and understanding who communicates with the central bank. So as I go through, the, I understand that the ministry is going to communicate with the employee through either our accounts department or our, our HR department about our salary for the month of July, by a particular time in July? Yeah, we want to do it. You may even get in June. So to start in July, you'll probably get the communication coming directly to you and via June. email from the Ministry of Public Service. So during that time, so Mary Jane now informs... Ministry of Public Service. Ministry of Public Service. Let me help you. Right. It would be probably the head of the department right. who would then communicate it to the Ministry of Public Service. Right. Public Service then sends on the information to Central Bank, and whether it is Central Bank within Central Bank or Central Bank working with a third party um, provider in terms of managing the process, that has to be worked out now with us and Central Bank. Mm -hmm. But effectively, that is what will instruct them to deal with the bonds or issue the bonds to whoever. In some instances, I think Dr. Greenwich had indicated that there could be a third party assignment by you. So if you, Sergeant Blackman, say, I'm assigning mine to Mia Motley, you understand, to buy, then I will buy yours. Or I'm assigning mine to Public Workers Credit Union or the Police Credit Union or whoever. Um, and you can, at the beginning, say, look, I'm opting in for the full 18 months. Or you can say, at this stage, I'm only opting for one month. Or I can say I'm opting for six months because I got a bill at courts and that bill finishing in five months' time. And by the time that five months is done, I need to keep some money for a month um, to buy something for my child's birthday, which is that month, and to pay another bill. So I'm going to opt from month seven to take my bonds. So basically, it's a blank canvas that only you who know your circumstances. And because remember, each bond is a strip bond. In other words, month by month by month. So you have 18 bonds for 18 months. You can choose not to take for a few months and take, and then don't take. Or you could choose to take for the whole time. Or you could choose to take and then don't take. It's your, it's your choice, my brother. What it is, however, is the overall thing we need to be our brothers, sisters, and keepers, okay? But we do accept that individual circumstances will be different. So with one of your other sister unions, they've already indicated, for example, that 92% of their membership will take the bonds, okay? We expect that will vary from association to association and for want of a better phrase from ministry to ministry but because of the commitment of credit unions pensioners and other Barbadians who are saying I want some of them bonds we are satisfied that there is a market that is full for it correct correct and just one other question four years from now um, do you see the, let me say that 
the, the 18 months um, totals $10,000. Do you see the, the, the spend compared to 2020? Do you see it changing over four years, the same, the value of the, of the same 10000 In other words, will inflation so reduce the value of your money? Unlikely, but what really would have reduced it would have been a devaluation. And that's why we had to take the actions that we took over the last 18 months. Because a devaluation doesn't come like inflation. A devaluation comes like a thief in the night and just chop you down. Um, inflation tends to be, more, in our part of the world, more like water going down a hill. So it can still eat in. But that's why, remember, the bank is paying you less interest than the inflation rate. Chances are we are going to have higher interest with this bond, I hope, than our inflation rate most of the next four years. Okay? Zoom, you have somebody on Zoom? Or oh, so we can take somebody else on the floor? We'll take the floor while they set up. How are we doing the Zoom? Because we're not seeing it on screen no. yet. No, she's going to read from her computer the, the Zoom, Zoom responses. Okay. Okay, we'll take this gentleman and then we'll do the zoom out. Okay. Sorry. Hi, good morning. Good morning, ma'am. <laughs> so my first question is, will the redirection of the funds and the investment in capital works mean a recruitment program for the skilled artisans and laborers uh, within the communities by the Ministry of Transport and Works? or will it be done by private contractors and the recruitment is left up to them? Both, both. both. So let, let me explain for the benefit of most. Um, government had a capital works program um, that we've augmented, some of which I've announced already that we would do. In fact, when we had our first consultation with um, civil society and the political parties at the Hilton, we indicated a lot of what we were going to be doing then. We're going to fix some schools that need fixing. We can't fix all, but we'll fix some. We're going to fix some government buildings. You know, there's a ministry in Reef Road, for example, that's been abandoned. Um, that used to be the Ministry of Commerce in Reef Road. Um, there are going to be buildings like the old waterworks building there in the pine that's been abandoned. So there are a number of properties, and why? Government is paying out over $70 million a year in rent. And at some point, that's what we've inherited. We have to bring that rental bill down. And that can only be done by us bringing back into productive use some of the properties. Um, thanks. Secondly, we have to continue the process of the laying of water mains as well as the temporary desal plants that were negotiated and received back by the Barbados Water Authority a few months ago, as well as us doing the project I have spoken about for some time from Vineyard to Stuart Hill to Bowmanston in order to be able to guarantee that we can get more water in the north of the island, in particular in St. Joseph, St. John, St. Andrew. In addition to that, I don't need to tell any of you in here about the state of the roads. And as much as we've been trying our best, the truth is that the state of the majority of the roads has deteriorated because there was no regular maintenance for a significant period of time. Um, we're going to be able to expand that. In addition, we're also talking to the Chinese government for, to sign a memorandum of understanding to do capital works from along the entire east coast through the Scotland district, which as you know, if you want to visit Disney World or Disneyland, you only need to go at that section there, going from um, Foster Hall back down through <laughs> to Codrington um, College, and it's the closest thing to a joyride or roller coaster that you'll come to. In addition to that, we need to clean up Barbados. I've said it over and over. I just passed through White Park again, around Louis Lynch School. I sent a message to the, um, the people by NCC for the, the bushes to go there. Um, but we also have a lot of lots, 
And remember I had indicated that we were going to bring the legislation and shift the burden to landowners from April. We've had to push that back for obvious reasons. But at the same time, we can't let the country stay in bush. And it's not just there, but it's the wells. It's um, a reason for flooding. So there are all kinds of reasons where we have to do that, clean the gullies, clean the lots, clean the beaches. And then, of course, there's the digitization. How many of you are all tired doing longhand writing? I mean, those of you who work in the police certificate of character office now must be being hailed by all who come in now as, 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 as people who we want to hug up because you are now producing a certificate of character within what? Minutes, Mr. Boyce, DCP? Within, it shouldn't be hours because it's a real-time solution. So, but what it isn't is within six weeks and four weeks before a person would get a job offer and can get the police certificate of character to go for the job. So I'm just detailing out for you. Um, Mr. DePiz, I think you're on the QEH board, and I keep making the point that while you all were not part of the original digitization program, we're going to have to bring you all in largely because as soon as you walk in, you have hundreds of thousands of records. What do records do in a hospital? They gather dust. <laughs> so. We need to digitize and we need to have as many people doing that over the course of the next two months, okay? So I give you those to show you that some will be public sector engaging people temporarily and some will be public sector contracting with the private sector who will do it. In addition, we've also said that we will expedite all town planning permissions that have no major issues. Um, so that they can get as much work in the private sector done where people have access to their own funding already. John? Another question is, in the event of an emergency, such as a health emergency, and a person has been paying bonds over a significant period of time, however, that two-year period has not come as yet, are there parameters or protocols in place to make liquidation available for the individual? And if so, what time period? May what available to the individual, sorry? Any of the savings that would be... To saved have liquidity. Special. Yeah, well, remember we just said just now you can opt in or opt out at any point in time. Um, if there's another emergency, first of all, it's not two years, it's only 18 months. Um, if, for example, things come to an end and things go back, sweet, 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 we may not even need to go to the full 18 months. But I think that a number of you would want to continue to stay in because of the 5%. So I would be loath to break it given the commitment that we've given. But the liquidity option is always there. You can always go liquid. What I want to say, and you know me, I believe in telling people as it is. So that, and we said it on Thursday, I repeat it now. On the day on which your bonds, you're making decisions about your bonds, you're going to trade at the full price, 100 cents in a dollar. I cannot guarantee, however, that if you choose at some point in between, hopefully I think most of the credit unions will trade with you at par or almost at par. That means only at 100 cents. A bond can also trade above par because the demand for it is so great that people will say, I'm going to give you 102 cents in the dollar for your 100 cents because that 5% interest is too good for me to pass up. So that even if I give you 2 cents more, I get in my 5% interest on the principal. They can equally say, I'm going to give you 3 or 4 cents less. But on the day on which you make your elections for your salary every month, in other words, when it's coming from government to you, 100 cents in the dollar. However you deal with it in between or after, like everything else, like the cash in your pocket, depends on what you spend it on, what you invest it on, etc. So I want to make that clear, because what are we really doing? And, and just bear with me for two minutes. We are closing the circle of enfranchisement. And just study ahead. In the 1930s, when they had the riots, 1937, 
By 1938, the Barbados Progressive League, which is the Barbados Labour Party, was formed. And we started the process of political enfranchisement. But that was easy because Charles Duncan O'Neill had started from years before agitating and Marcus Garvey, etc. Then in 1941, the Barbados Workers' Union. So workers' enfranchisement. So you have political enfranchisement, you have workers' enfranchisement. Then you come in the 1950s and you get all of the labor legislation and you get West and Joseph and what do you call it? Um, Richmond. These youngsters in here don't know what Richmond and West and Joseph is. Translate it for them. Grantley Grant Adams School and St. Leonard School. Parkinson and Princess Margaret. And after Grantley built that, Earl Barr could come then immediately and say, free secondary education. So you had social enfranchisement, and then the hospital as well, labor law. So you had social enfranchisement taking place in the 50s and early 60s. And similarly, the continuity across governments continued with the social security being planned by Grantley, executed by Earl Barr. Then in the 70s, we start to realize we have got political enfranchisement, worker enfranchisement, Social, social enfranchisement, social security enfranchisement. The next big thing is what? Economic. But economic is a real, real horse that can get tame easy. <laughs> so economic has taken us decades. And you start with Tom Adams coming again with the Credit union movement, the tax incentives for you to put money in the credit union movement, which effectively has carried it from two, three hundred million to 2.4, 2.5 billion to what it is today. Then you have Tom with the land, tenantries freehold purchase at 10 cents a square foot. What was the greatest asset and the most important asset that most families can invest in? Land. So that tens of thousands. But that still, that did great for a number of people, but it's still not there. Then you have Owen Arthur coming with the economic enfranchisement through the 250 a square foot in the commercial, in the urban tenantries. And thousands of people have bought pursuant to that. What we are trying to do now is to create what is known potentially as a secondary market. And it allows people to trade and to buy and sell. Some people buy and sell cars. Some people buy and sell fruit and vegetables. All you're doing is buying and selling bonds. Okay? And why? Because different people have needs for finance. And so what we've not done a lot of, people, a company want money, they go to the bank. But in future, a company in Barbados could issue a corporate bond. And that corporate bond could pay you at three, four percent, which is more than the bank is paying you. As I said, if you invested $10,000 in the bank, you're gonna get anywhere between one and $10. Whereas if you put it in this bond, you're gonna get $500. So people just have to be given the opportunity, and this is one perfect way of us creating that opportunity while creating the fiscal space to allow us to employ your brothers and sisters, our brothers and sisters, and at the same time, <clears throat> keeping your job, and at the same time, allowing you the flexibility to save. Now, in Singapore, I'll leave with this last one. In Singapore, many, many years ago, 30, 40 years ago, they started taking 20% of every person's salary. Now, we're not going there, but you know why they did it? They did it to be able to allow them to invest in housing and to have a unit of savings that if they didn't, even if they didn't go into housing, they had that concept of savings. So even though savings, in 1997, Owen Arthur gave a budget about the importance of savings. And even though we haven't executed it fully, it is not a battle that we can leave. If our people are not to be tenants in their own country, if our people are to be owners because ownership matters, enfranchisement matters, 
then this is one of the ways that we can do it. Why is the credit union movement so powerful? You don't got a single person that richer than the richest person in the country, but the credit union movement collectively is richer than the majority of people in the country. And it is that pooling of resources, and it is done in most other cultures, that we need to master because ownership matters. My final question is that if there is, God forbid, a change in the political environment in Barbados, what guarantee do the, the workers have that there will be no changes to the parameters of the boss project? I, I don't want to think of a nightmare at this stage. <laughs> but if there is, <laughs> but if there is, look, we've gone on record and we've said, look, in the same way there was a change in the political environment from the time that the last Minister of Finance and the last Governor of the Central Bank issued savings bonds. You remember the calypsos that were playing on radio encouraging people to buy the savings bonds? And what did we do? We said, down to a brush, restructure all the rest. But these are ordinary Bajans who put the money in these bonds. And in fact, some of them coming up for repayment shortly. And in some instances, we are going to try to create something to give you an opportunity to be able to benefit again. And why? The government, we've done a good job of not really borrowing outside of the financial institutions just to stabilize our reserves. But ultimately, development requires that you borrow. That's how we move from one station in life to build a bigger house, we borrow. Most people can't buy a house or a car without borrowing. So we leverage what we have to access what we want. When the government has been issuing bonds and things in the past, who benefits? How many Bajans do you think used to benefit? But a credit union, or a teacher's credit union in California or Boston, making the interest rate <laughs> off of our capital. Now, at what point are we going to say not about here? Yes, sometimes you need to go to international borrowing because you need foreign exchange. But right now, whenever the government borrows is the insurance companies that pick up the paper, the credit unions pick up the paper, the banks pick up the paper, and a few of what I call the cognoscenti, those who were financially literate enough. I have asked the Minister of Commerce and Small Business, and he will tell you that I've been on his back about the establishment of financial literacy clinics because the same way we know how to read and write, and the same way we know how to count, the average Bajan child must know all that they need to know about financial literacy. And their parents now, hopefully over the course of the next few years, will get that opportunity to also be able to be literate in what are your options. And while we're doing this in Barbados, the truth is, Barbados has $9 billion in savings. $9 billion. And again, 0 0.1 down to 0 0.01. All of that may not now be liquid. But even if you were just to unlock 2 3 billion, <laughs> that's 20 to 30% of GDP. But let's now go to the region, because remember Barbados, not me, Barbados chairs the CARICOM single market and single economy. You know how much liquidity we got in the region? In savings? 50 billion US dollars. But we keep looking north, and we keep looking east, and we keep looking west, but we don't look within. Okay, so that when a hotel is destroyed by a hurricane. And it's a well-known hotel, well-known chain, well-managed, gives you good accounts every year. All of us in here should still be able to pick up a regional bond and have a mixture because what is he saying? Don't put all your eggs in what? In one basket. 
And whether it is the Social Security Scheme Investment, NIS Investment Guidelines, or you as an individual, don't put all your eggs in one basket. So if you've got a piece in the bank, you've got a piece in bonds there, you've got a piece in a meeting turn, you got a piece and you work out and decide how best you save. But those are the kinds of conversations that we need to have. But most things in life only happen when a crisis intervenes to capture the attention of everybody. Because in the absence of the crisis, how many people will be listening to me now about bonds? Not many. What are you talking about? Get on with life. But because it now affects each and every one of us, it's opening our minds not just to what is being asked of us, but the opportunities, the opportunities. I have a gardener who went and put a pipe next to his bed. And for years, he told me, he used to put all his silver dollars <laughs> and 25 cents and 10 cents and everything inside there. Until obviously when he went to the bank, it was a mob of ton of money. For my own person, and I don't have no problem sharing my business, from the time I became Minister of Education, somebody whispered something to me, uh, and if I was Billy Miller, she'd tell me, what you don't see, you don't miss. What you don't see, you don't miss. And she said it for two things, for food and for money. Don't bring in your house anything that you shouldn't eat. Okay, if it's in there, you can't eat it. And for money, put aside, and since 1995, I've been putting aside $300 in the credit union every month. I don't look at it, I don't touch it, I just put it there. When we were in primary school, what did they tell us? Save for what? A rainy day. They didn't tell us we should have said save for COVID. But now you can say save for a rainy day or for a COVID. Because in the psyche of the people who taught us, the last great pandemic was really 1918 to 1920. As a primary school child, how many of us went and got polio vaccines? We heard about smallpox when we were growing up early, but they were getting on top of it. So this is just our cross to bear. Thank you. The first question we have, if I die or become incapacitated during the 18 months of savings, what happens to my bonds? It's part of your estate. So it goes to whoever. If you don't have a will, then the laws of um, administration set in. Um, if you have a will, well then mm -hmm. the will determines who gets it. Thank you. Another one? Can I, can I continue with the other question? Yes. yes. Thank you. What happens if the amount of the bond, based on the percentage applicable, is higher than the employee's net pay after other deductions and the balance to be paid by the Treasury cannot cover those deductions which may be legally signed to, such as mortgages. So the, um, <clears throat> the, per the percent that is actually in bonds is on the net salary ta after taxes and um, NAS comes out. So what you're asking is that after that comes out, and then the employee has a few commitments at the um, treasury, takes out money. Uh, he don't have enough, but he still wants to save. Mm -hmm. I, I believe you have a few options there. Let, just the employee will look at his um, expense envelope. Let's say one is a, a car payment, mm -hmm. but he still wants to save. Since it must come from his, board, his um, salary, I would say that employee should engage with his um, financial institution to have that payment come to his bank account as opposed to his salary to free up that space so he can invest in the bonds. Because you can't bring money outside from the banking system, your account, and put it in there. So first of all, so let's say the employee um, 
when he finished, uh, he needs, he can only save a small portion, or he want to save all. The real trick is to just engage your financial institution. Say, listen, instead of taking, instead of my money now coming from the treasury to pay for my sister's car loan, I want you now to take the money from my deposit, pay for the car loan. What that does is for him the space to invest in the bond. So everyone's circumstance is different. You just got to look and see uh, how you can take advantage of it. And in many instances, remember that you, this is not a one-off opportunity to talk with us or to talk to the credit union movement. I think you're going to find more and more um, financial institutions having to put financial advisors in place to advise ordinary citizens what to do. Um, this notion that the only people who you should advise is people who are the hyper and super wealthy is something that we're not going to agree to. And that's why I would like to see a financial literacy clinic in the north, in, on the east coast somewhere, um, in the west coast, in St. Philip, in St. George, and on the south coast, genuine Christchurch, Oyston somewhere. So you have five or six financial literacy clinics. And why? How many people you know say, Lord, I can't breathe, I can't sleep, I can't move because these bills got me choke. And as an MP, it goes through it all the time. And when you start to work it out, and you say, look, if you refinance, what you're paying now, you're paying out $2,800 a month and getting $4,500 in take-home pay. Mm -hmm. That 2800 can be restructured, but you need to have a credit union or a bank willing to work with you. And we can probably bring that down to 1600 or 1700 but you spread it out over a longer period of time. Those are the kinds of things that you want Bajans to be able to think. My grandfather used to tell me, land don't spoil. Think about it and true. Other than the pieces at the end of Glen Burnie that drop in the water, for the most part, land don't spoil. So that land is one of the best investments and it's the one that culturally, culturally, our people have been encouraged to use. But land isn't always as liquid as you would like it and you may not want to sell a piece of land for $100,000 or $80,000 where you really only need 10. <laughs> so you have to learn and teach people then how to use the system. So you may say, look, I got these bonds here. I want to be able to leverage them, to borrow something, and I will assign the bonds to you in order for you to lend me once the numbers make sense. Okay? Let me just add to what you said. I'm recognizing that public workers in terms, not everyone will fail as a prime minister indicated with financial instruments and how they work. And in this regard, the central bank is playing even a larger role to ensure that, for example, the seamless transfer of your money into liquidity oh, cash nice. if you want it at the pay there. And even after that, Central Bank is maintaining your, your bond account. And you can have it, you will get a statement every month from Central Bank about your bond account and transactions. But you can also call and say, listen, I got $6,000 saved in my bond account. I need to 4000 because I got a medical emergency or I need to travel or I got to do this. And how, how can you first say it? And you say, you know, having to find a broker and all that. The central bank has agreed to play that role in terms of facilitating um, in the absence of the financial. So no public sector worker is disadvantaged because he just doesn't know what to do, right? Good evening, <clears throat> good afternoon, Prime Minister, the distinguished head table. I understand the concept that is being put forward, and uh, I think it has a win-win situation within. But I wanted to know, how do you treat to continuous acting, uh, using that as the, the, net, the net salary? How, how do you mean? Whatever your salary is, whether you're acting or not acting, you can determine and remember because it's 18 strip bonds, 
Suppose you were acting in something, you continue to act for the next four or six months. And you ideally wanted to be able to save, let's say, $500, okay? All of a sudden, six months from now, the interviews, regrettably you didn't get the post, somebody else is now there, you've reverted, and in truth and in fact, you can't afford to pay that $500 anymore. You just indicate that as of next month, I want to change it to $200. So it is flexible enough to meet all of the exigencies, all of the vagaries of your particular employment. Um, the only thing that it will not meet is continuous pay after death or retirement. So that, but other than that, you do as you, as, as you want to direct. Um, what we have to perfect is the mechanism, and that's why as soon as these meetings finish today and tomorrow, my next focus is being able to ensure that the execution can be as seamless as possible, recognizing that I'm not an IT person, but whoever the IT person has got to sit down and come and sit down with me now, and we talk it through step by step by step by step from it leaving the desk of the Ministry of Public Service to the head of department, to the individual persons. Um, and then the easiest way, obviously, is for everybody to give in their emails so that a mass email can go with the thing. Um, there will be some legislation that will have to be passed still out of an abundance of caution, not because we absolutely need it, because obviously if it is consensual, then um, you know, but I also know that there are people who like to test the court for everything, so if they're testing it, I can get a piece of legislation that is sunset to test it with as well. Um, but basically, it's a white canvas and you get to paint. We just need to make sure you get the canvas at the beginning, and then any time that you need the canvas thereafter, you can get it and say, change, move there, move that, don't do this. Okay. I'm not. If I were to use And if, if you are promoted, you can also write back and say, I was asking for five hundred, haven't been promoted now. I'd like to put in eight hundred or nine hundred. And given the fact that we're asking everybody and I'm sorry that oh Mr. McDowell is coming back, the NUPW has been very clear about and um, the BWU about um, and say to Sab about the appointments and in particular um, with the health workers and with you in the police, etc., and we are working now because the backlog of appointments um, has been considerable. And I've made a policy decision as minister with the public, for the public service that persons who have three years or more acting in a position who do not have any negative reports on their file that there is absolutely no reason why they cannot be taken on block because the government's position is appoint the people. Now, let me equally say, because people are appointed does not mean that they are immune from discipline. And that's the difference that I have with others. And at the end of the day, there are people who say, oh, don't appoint them yet, because you know this and you know that. Uh -uh. The people are doing the job. Appoint the people, but hold them accountable for the job for which they are employed to do. So I expect that during the course of this time, some of you will be appointed and may want, therefore, to be able to increase what you started off saving. And, and my last question is, if I were to use uh, Dr. Greenwich's uh, example, where at the end of four years, I think the accum uh, accumulated total was 4,000 plus. Can I, in July, do a calculation and say, well, okay, it's going to be 4,000 plus, pay for, uh, invest in, 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 in the bonds and, uh, and avoid uh, deductions from my salary? You're asking if you could, like, you intended to pay a uh, In that example, the person was in the 7%. Mm -hmm. You were saying, you know, instead of paying 7%, which is 237, let me pay 4,000 one time. 
you what, have to what I'm asking them, really so. is whether or not if I were to calculate and pay up front the total, mm -hmm. uh, would I then have to, on a, on a monthly basis, advise that I do not intend to, to have bonds? So at the beginning because of the month, it's optional. you can say what you want to pay, and you don't have to change it until you need to. But we, in order to get everyone share, because we, you know, we're still mindful that we have, as a member tell you, we want to be fiscal prudent, so we want to make sure that, because this is debt. And we don't want to create too much debt. So instead of letting one individual take 4,000, we want to make sure we share it among everyone. So we wouldn't want to put 4,000 out on one person in one paycheck. We prefer you to do piece by piece and get the 18 strips. That allows everyone to share in the, in the scheme much more beneficial. Okay? But there'll be a time for you if you have a piece of change like that. You can also, if you have the extra money, purchase on the secondary market through the central bank or the credit union. Any, where any employee may have given up theirs, you can purchase and, and top up your, your bond account at any point in time. Okay? Okay. Tony. Um, this I'm Mark. Mark. This Mark. I'm Mark. Have a question. Uh, it's not, oh, yeah. I guess I could start with the commendations for the Prime Minister and her team over the last six weeks of this crisis. You've handled the country well, and I guess everyone here shares my sentiments in that regard. Um, Thank you, Mark. This bond is a fantastic instrument for public sector workers. It's probably the first time in the history of the public service that you had at your disposal a financial instrument to invest in. And really, the leadership should have come from the, you know, those responsible for the labor movement to give us encouragement to invest in this bond. My concern, PM, is we have a 1% of the banks and we have a 5% of your bond. It's more attractive. This bond is more. The banks ain't even 1%. The banks is 0 0.1. 0 0.1. And some are even less than 0 0.1. So the banks are also able to invest in this. What I'm saying is this is, a, this is a program for the public sector worker. And for banks or credit unions to be able to go in and get the same 5%, it may, it may defeat that economic enfranchisement that you refer to. What I'm suggesting to you, Prime Minister, that each public sector worker has this program is for them is the vendor. And if you want to buy these bonds, you have to buy through the vendor, which will be the public sector worker. This is a chance for the unions to- But Mark, really Mark, that is exactly way. that. We were you, you know, that is exactly that. Mm. The only way a credit union, a bank, or anybody who's a non-public sector worker get their hands on a bond is if a public sector worker chooses to cash out his and say, I don't want bonds, I want cash. Then that is available on the open market. Right? Because it still helps us achieve the fiscal objective of increasing our capital works program. But what you're saying is very important is that if a public sector worker really can afford it, they should hold this, this option. Right? And that's the point. Just, just if I can, and we have definitely encouraged that. And in a previous iteration of the proposal, it may not have been so plain, but the trade union movement has insisted that public servants should get first option and first refusal in these. So even if one public sector worker cannot afford to take up the opportunity, another public se sector worker who can should be able to within departments. Um, within, within departments to also take up the opportunity. So it is totally for the public sector first and foremost. I must tell you also, Mark, that it is in the discussion with trade unions that the flexibility component of this really came to fruition and, and morphed into what you see it today. Is in, I, because we were involved all the time and is there insisting that we try to think outside the box to make it truly optional. That's why I tell you there's no incentive for us to say anything otherwise that it's truly optional. And that came really by the prompting and the discussions and ideas. In fact, I will confess that the term boss, the acronym, actually came out of the, the movement as opposed from, from the government side. But it's a clap for that. <laughs> so we um, don't, we let, don't have a copyright to that. I'm coming up, Barry, but let me just say to Mark once well, also, um, and I think the point that the General Secretary was making is that in departments, um, it, but it doesn't have to be within a department. I said that, but it could really be across any public yeah. sector worker that you know. Perfect. But if people who can't do it, and you've got friends who can, Nobody is stopping you from letting them take it. But equally, if the credit union does it, what happens? 
the credit union, instead of earning 0.1% for their collective deposits, will now earn, and Mr. O'Neill is a credit union man, so I would expect him to, to, to make that case too. A credit union will now be earning 5%. Now, when the credit union earns more, who benefits? The members, because your shareholders, which means dividends, so that in a sense, you actually have the potential then to benefit twice by going with the credit union. Uh, I, like you, I'm a credit union member too, so forgive me if I um, <laughs> promote them, not because of that specifically, but I really, really feel that we have to close the circle of enfranchisement in this country so that Bajans are not tenants in their own land but owners in their own country. I'll make the last point now for you. Everybody's asking why only public servants. In fact, I have a message from one of the people from online who is asking specifically of us. Many of the retired members within the labor movement are inquiring about their ability to purchase bonds. I know that government wants to set limits for the debt incurred by the bonds, However, they are very enthused by the interest rates and feel that they're suffering by what is now ordered um, and being paid by the commercial banks. Can they be considered? Now, the bottom line is that we have to get the numbers right too, because too far east is always west. west. And therefore, the two things that we know that we're trying to be able to deal with this year are one, the $100 million that we want for additional capital works there, but secondly, we know that we have to go back at the market at some point, even though we have some monies that we can use, we don't want to use up all of the liquidity we have as well in the event of a second wave or a third wave of COVID, which as you know the WHO has said is entirely possible. So we may have to go back to the market with a pandemic solidarity bond for the NIS in the future. And in that one, that would be more open to the whole public. Its terms and conditions will be similar, may not be the 5%, it may be four, four and a quarter, or whatever. But the point is that there's going to be another opportunity beyond this for those who are non-public servants, okay? Good morning, distinguished head table and members in this forum. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Madam Chair, Co-Chair, I feel constrained to raise to speak with my credit union hat on my head. Somewhat invisible, I must say. The point I make here is in response to Mark's presentation of lumping the credit union movement with the banking sector or with the banks. For banks, we are customers. In the credit union movement, we are members. By, by distinction, then, we are the owners of the movement, of the capital within the movement. And the examination of the presentation by Dr. Greenwich reveals that there is an arrangement in place or being proposed and considered for the credit unions like other financial institutions to register with the central bank to give them access to these bonds. It therefore means that we are the individual public servant who is also a substantially, when we look at our membership base, the membership base substantially of the credit union movement across Barbados are individual public servants. It means that if that individual public servant determines that he or she do not want the bond, then the credit union movement as a financial institution has access to purchase back the bond as the Prime Minister was just saying and still ensure that that bond and the benefit arriving there, deriving therefrom will stay within the movement, will stay within the control of the average Barbadian worker and his or her family. So I just want to make the distinction that the credit union movement is better placed and more committed in terms of its domestic construct than the bank is to access and control and protect this investment. Uh, that is my contribution. Well said. I am not clear about this optional, the boss. Is it optional that 
you sign on for the bond or you have to do the deduc deduction. Whether as a start for 18 months, you do it for four months, then two months, but in all you must do the deduction. You don't have is to it do it optional at, you or don't have is to, it you don't have, to, do have it at, to do it? You don't have to do it at all. At the end of the day, if you choose that you don't want to have bonds at all, uh -huh. you can say, I don't want bonds, I only want cash. In which case, the credit union or whoever is registered with the central bank or the brokers that they have will say, I want to pick up those that nobody's assigned to anybody else. Um, so you'll so still get your full cash? So I will still get my full salary at the end of the month? Yeah. Okay. It just comes from two different sources. Yeah. Kevin? Right. So what you're saying is that I have to, I have to wait till the central bank sell the bond before no. I get my no, bond. No, no, no. Get it the same time as, this, as normal. If you get it, your salary the same way. Let's say you used to get 5000 in your bank account. Uh -huh. You're going to see 5000 The difference is you might see it from two sources. You will see, say, 4500 the majority coming from the treasury. And then you see from the central bank coming the other 500, but no delay. You don't have to wait the central bank. In fact, the central bank picks up the bond immediately and buy it, but turn around and sell it, just to ensure that no public sector worker has to wait for their money. So you go to the bank, your money will be there. So the money is going to be de deducted anyway. Pardon me? It's going to be deducted anyway. No, okay, let's, let's look at it from your perspective. You say you don't want no bond, you want cash. Mm -hmm. You sign that for I me. I don't want you all touching my salary. Fully Good. Now. No. You don't want me to touch your salary. Good. Then when you go to the bank, you will see your full salary. Okay. That's the end. The only difference to be fully transparent is that you will see it coming from two sources. You will see, say, 4,500 4, coming from the treasury, as you normally see. And you will see the remaining piece coming from the bank, and it will add up to the full amount. That's what you will see. All we are saying is that behind these scenes, government issues a bond still in your name and is sold off to the credit union so that some other credit union or other member can benefit from. But for your purposes, you get your full cash as you want it, on time with your paycheck, no delay. This is just a comment. I think a lot of us are worried because we don't, we don't know if we can afford to have that bond at the end of the month. We do what? Sorry, we please. don't know we if can we, can, we can't afford to have it. Right. That's right. Just let me finish. Go ahead. My feeling is this. I think we all would like to participate in helping the country, quote, unquote. It's just that for me, $335 at the end of the month is hard. What about for some of us? You bring a bond that is, say, 100, like for somebody like me, I may be able to afford 100. I think what people are feeling is that the percentages that you all put out there, for some of us, it's too high. But let me repeat, and I think we are on the same page. You are saying exactly what I told you, what I said to you. If you, if you by default, supposed to have 300, you say, listen, I can only afford 50 dollars. That is all that will be allocated to you. You will get the remaining cash. So, but and, still, and, it will still have to come. It won't come to the, you know, the, to, the, the total. Let me say that if, yeah, example just now, five thousand. Let's say five thousand, and the five hundred was allocated to you in bonds. You say, listen, I can't afford to save five hundred. I want to save a hundred. Mm -hmm. You will get your forty-nine hundred in the bank. The same way the hundred a bond. And or, every month for 18 yep. months. Yep. Yes, but beautifully, okay. because we do it every month, you might come to a position where you say, listen, I like the fact that you get a flow of income, and now my situation is ease a bit, increase that 100 to 200. And you say so in November, that will be done. And then later you say, no, I've got to fall back. So it's fully flexible. You can say any amount from zero to 100% of that bond, you can say convert. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. But thank you for your question, because I think other persons, it helps to reinforce the other person, the flexibility of, the, of, it, of it. And before the question comes, it's just important for you to note that the trade unions also made sure of that. That wasn't the case last week, Monday, but it is the case now. Putting in the plugs wherever we can. Just before you come, um, Madam Prime Minister, I think you will recognize this lady in blue. 
I would like you to recognize the Zoom immediately after um, this participant. All right, just one thing. I'm just basing on what is being said in my organization and other organizations. We're not clear. I hope it is clearer for you after this morning's presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning to the panel. Um, I came here this morning to really say to the government, this is a really amazing, amazing plan. Boss plan, as it's called. And I am happy as a public servant to be able to make a commitment. It's really hard to say that we all have disposable income. We really don't. But when I think about what this plan will do, how it will help my brothers, how it will help my sisters, how it will help my family, I have no choice. Even though I don't have a lot of fiscal space, I will find some money. I will find money because as a social worker, I understand the deprivation. I understand the hardship that is out there. When I think about that household mitigation program, assistance program that the government would have just put in place, I know I sound a little teary because when I look and see how that's helping individuals out there, I can tell you some of us, we might not, because of where we are or where we sit, we don't get to see that every day, but I get to see it. And I'm very happy that the government came up with a program that will be give me the opportunity to invest my money, not only invest my money to help save, I got a problem saving. And if I buy a bond, it can help me to save. So I am very happy. And my real concern though, is how this message is going to get out to the worker who really needs to come on board. There are a lot of negative energies out there. Where I say I hear people saying this program started telling individuals don't invest in the bonds and because they're not hearing and they don't understand, we need to get the message out. We need to go department by department depot by depot we need to get this message out because there are i get some negative things on my phone that is going wrong on social media about why people should not participate in the bond and i really think the message need to go out and i come here this morning to say to the government not that you will not get full participation because my understanding is whether i participate or not the bond can still be sold on my behalf and the government will still be getting the fickle space. But I want, just like the Prime Minister, I want Barbadians to invest in something that we can get back some sort of money. So I really would like the unions to get up. Don't sit down here, get out in the departments and get the message out. My question now, can the unions buy some of these bonds on behalf of their members? I yeah. know. Yes, I forget. So, uh, have, <laughs> hold on. I know the unions might not have a lot of money because, you, you know, but I think you still have some money that you can take up. And if I cannot buy a bond, buy it on my behalf. Okay? So that is my question. Can the unions buy bonds for their members? Yes, sister. Um. So, I just want to appeal. I know this is becoming live public servants. Stop thinking about yourself and think about your brothers and sisters. I swear, I at the bottom of the pay, pay grade, but I can still find at least some sort of money to invest. All of us. Go take any money out of the, the banks and put it in the bonds. You can get back your bond or your money whenever you want it. So I just want to say to the government, this is so, so amazing. And I can't wait. I, I, I might not be able to start July, but I can start. So just letting you know that this is an amazing plan, and thank you. Thank uh, you sister, so the Prime Minister would want to respond in a different way. But since you posed the question to the trade union, the trade union is the membership. So give us some more money, and then we could transform into a financial institution. But underscoring that, uh, I hope the point work, is not let's, lost. Let's work together to make Barbara this world class. So everybody can be smiling. Uh, well, okay. Uh, but the whole business of these six meetings 
is to achieve precisely what you spoke about. Information, you are only empowered with information. And if we had taken it on ourselves to come to sell or introduce this program to you, there would be questions that you raised that I could not necessarily answer as persuasively or as convincingly as the Prime Minister or Dr. Greenwich can. So the real reason for this meeting is to give the membership an opportunity to quiz, to comment, to criticize, to support the BOSS program with the originators of it being present. Prime Minister, I believe you want to entertain a Zoom. We have several questions on Zoom. Um, I propose to ask three that are similarly related and then pause for the response. How will this be reflected on income tax at year end? Will the bonds por portion sorry, be viewed as an investment or salary earned? On payday, will I get my instrument in hand? And thirdly, <clears throat> can an employee who is retiring decide to opt in a percentage of their gratuity in bonds? All right, thank you. The first one is, let me see. <laughs> <laughs> Need a reminder? Yeah, remind me first of the Will Still this be my reflected coffee. on my income tax no, no. at Okay, right. So this, this boss program impacts your income tax zero way. There's no impact on your income tax. It, remember, it is on net after tax and it has a net take-home salary. The only difference is that you're taking it home two different ways. So there's zero impact on your, um, your income tax. But also, remember that usually the interest earned from any investment is tax. A withholding tax is applied to that. In this instance, that is not applied either. So zero withholding tax. So interest is yours, and the money in your account, your bond account, is just the money in your deposit account at a commercial bank or a credit union. Nothing to do with your tax. Um, the second question is about. Will I get my instrument in hand? Yes, yes. What happened is, remember, it matures in four years. So the instrument you put in in July, let's say you put in 500, that's bond number one. 500. Every six months, you will get interest on that 500, which is $25 every month, $12.50 every six months. So that at the end of four years, you get interest, all your interest. On, on the July 2024, that 500 that you put in initially is then sent as cash to your bank account or the designated account at the credit union, wherever. So you get it back at the end of the period. And the last one was about gratuity. Yes, please. How about the question? Gratuity. Um, if you put, is it about putting gratuity as part of it? It, it would appear so that this so, person wants to know it comes if they back. are due to retire soon, mm -hmm. can they opt to have a percentage of their gratuity? It's, it's, it's something we can look at. I'm not going to say yes or no from this platform because it really comes back down to, to how much space we have. Um, we don't want to go too, too high. We could go above 100 million, but it has to be the subject of internal discussions now with our debt management unit um, because one of the things that we don't ever want to do in this country is to so bunch debt again that it becomes a problem. So I have learned after 30 years in public life that I don't mm -hmm. give answers that sound good. I give answers that are truthful and endure and are capable of implementation. So let us get the right guidance mm -hmm. and we'll come back to you on that. But gratuities are a government expenditure and technically it falls within it. It's just a question of what fiscal space it will create and what room we have left, okay? We are getting close to the limit, so those persons on the floor who have questions, I want to ask, don't be hesitant, start making your way towards the mics. I need to make an announcement. 
The Transport Board will provide a bus service to Bridgetown at the end of the session, for those who need, of course. The bus will be at the front entrance to the gym. I am not sure which front, but the front entrance to the gym. They go up there? Yeah. Um, I am advised that it is, oh yes, a paid bus service. So those persons with questions, if nobody is moving to the mic, I will take, ah. Good afternoon to the head table. Will a category five hurricane not impact on the, for, impact our force restructuring upon the boss program? Sorry, B. Yeah, I got it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> if we have a category five, category four, category three, category two, category one, or tropical storm curve, I pray first that there is no loss of life. But, and I pray that there is limited loss of property. But the truth is that because in our restructured bonds, we put in a natural disaster clause, and if I kick myself for anything, is not extending that natural disaster clause to pandemic. But we're actually going to be better fiscally off than we are now, because a natural disaster like Tropical Storm Kirk, remember that? It, that was last September 2018. Nobody didn't die, we had a few roofs, literally a handful. We got money from CRIF. That kind of storm will immediately, or anything stronger, will immediately trigger a suspension of all of our debt payments. All of the principal, you don't pay for two years. And all of the interest that we would have paid on our debt goes now on the back end to be paid when we recover. What does that mean in real terms? That over a two year period, we will literally not have to pay $1.7 billion in debt service, which will allow us to take that $1.7 billion and deal with all of the losses and all of the rebuilding. So if we have to help people whose houses are uninsured, we're in a position to be able to give them something. If we have to help farmers who, um, whose crops have been damaged, in the storm, we're in a position to give them a little something. So the truth is, is that far from put us under pressure with bonds, it actually eases the pressure from us significantly. Okay. Okay, secondly, since the BOSS program is an optional scheme and a wide cross-section of Barbadians express an interest in buying bonds, why is the option to purchase bonds not left open to the general public? rather than to the public servants? I think we answered that a few times for you. So that the truth is that it comes down to literally not wanting to take on more debt than we need to take on. Just because you can have access to all the cake and sweet bread that you want, you don't eat it all at once. Because at the end of the day, it's bad for you. So just because we could have access to all the debt that we want, we're not going to take it because it would be the wrong and immature and reckless thing to do. But I have told you that there is likely to be one other major instrument coming later in the year that will allow us to help stabilize the national insurance scheme, which is critical because all of us are here ultimately will have to do what? Depend on it. And therefore, the Unemployment Benefit Fund in every country, in every part of the world, was established without a thought ever being given for this kind of pandemic. As a result, government is going to have to put monies into the NIS to stabilize because the Unemployment Benefit Fund at the outset would have had about $20 million. Delcia, about $20 million. And the Unemployment Benefit Fund, it probably had about 20 million. The yeah. Severance Fund is a lot healthier. So we have to put money back into the NIS to help it do its job and to be able to support the people who are now claiming all of those, okay? 
Zoom. Three more. Can the central bank keep interest payments until the majority of the bond? Sorry, until the maturity of the bond. Sorry, that would be a different type of instrument. Usually, the typical savings bonds are like that. But this one, we want to, we also constantly the fact that we want to create some liquidity, a stream of income coming in for the bondholders. So your money, will, your insurance interest earned will go directly to your account every six months. Okay. I think that this is an opportunity, Barry, Edwin, for the credit union movement to look at a special savings account for people who want to accumulate the interest separately, almost like a fixed deposit type thing mm -hmm. that mirrors the life of it rather than us. Because we wanted to give you as much liquidity, there are different types of bonds. You could have a bond that gives you all your interest at the end, but that was not what we were hearing from the labor movement. Labor movement wanted, and we agreed with them, ultimate liquidity and flexibility. And to that extent, even instead of having one bond, you're getting now 18 strip bonds so that you can do and play with it as much as you want. Okay? But I do think there's an opportunity, certainly for the credit union movement, and if not them, for the traditional meet and turn. <laughs> with the, the interest. Next question. <clears throat> Ultimately, government's ability to honor the bonds four to six years from now will depend not on the legal framework, but on the state of the economy. What would government's balance sheet, that is, fiscal deficit, foreign reserves, inflation, etc., have to look like to enable government to meet its boss obligations? Like Bert. Meaning we're returning to the path we were on. This is a temporary shock. So if you look at the you look at the BERT program, that what we look like. We're not being facetious. Look, we've had to adjust our targets. Barbados has what is known as a fiscal anchor. Okay, we all know what an anchor does for a boat. Similarly, we have an anchor for our fiscal space, and our anchor says. We inherited a government that had debt to GDP at 177%. The government recorded formally 100 176%. The government recorded formally 157%. And then when we came in, we found another 19% of GDP that they owned from larboard to starboard. Everybody. So 177%. The BERT program says this. We can't bring this down overnight because it will just jettison everybody. People got to live. So what we negotiated and what we said to the IMF is that we are going to do this over a 15-year period. And we're going to come to what is the acceptable standard in 15 years' time. And what is that standard? 60% debt to GDP ratio. Clearly. To do that, it meant that instead of running deficits, because what a deficit is, as Kevin told you, I am spending more money than I'm earning. But I've got to bridge it every year. So any, every year that I run a deficit, it then becomes debt. And that's why government's debt ran in 2008. The government of Barbados owed six billion by 2018 without necessarily seeing what we had for it. The government now owed near $15 billion because they were borrowing. If you're running 7% deficits and 10% deficits, 6% deficit, it means that you are borrowing five, six hundred million, seven hundred million a year. So when you do that for 10 years, what do you end up with? From 6 billion to 15 billion. Our program is to say, look, we have to bring our debt to GDP ratio down. Does it mean that we don't borrow? No, because we still have to borrow. But we have to grow too. So we watch what we're borrowing and we try to grow. We watch what we're borrowing and we try to grow. And once we can do that, while at the same time Kevin's four horsemen of the apocalypse, <laughs> making sure that you can keep your reserves in good shape. Right now, Barbados' reserves, our import bill is probably what a week. 
65, 70 million? Yeah, correct. Yep. So divide 1.7 billion by 70, and you got how many import, how many weeks of import cover we had. When we took the government in June, May of, of the year before, we had 440 million, but we were also having to pay out 100 million in June of that month, and we also were in the hurricane season. Oh, and yeah. hence, and oil payments were also having to be made. So we knew that within 30 days of being in government, what we inherited would drop probably by over $100 million, in which case we'd be down to like three weeks of import cover. Import cover simply means that all of the foreign exchange I have has to be able to help me import what I need, food, oil, everything. Today, 7 in to 17 is what? 2. Carry 3 is 4. Huh? So even if you argue that the import cover is 70 million a week, that's 24 weeks of import cover. If you say that it is 80 million, and it is probably closer to 70, you'll see that however which way you look at it, we are well over 20 weeks of import cover. So that good, the debt good. You understand? The other things that we need to continue to make sure is that the government then runs as far as possible a balanced deficit, or if possible this year, a small surplus as we're trying to do. I can lose weight at six pounds a week, four pounds a week, or one pound a week. But however which way, you play, I'm still losing weight. And that's what a surplus is. So we're bringing down the debt as we go. So when we tell you that it looks like BERT, it really does, because the BERT program has been structured out. And you can go on the IMF site, and you can look at the Barbados program, and you can see that every year there are targets as to what we would meet. Now, the difference is, is that normally, and Kevin would tell you, normally you work in Africa for the IMF and all about, and the IMF has got going there and make enough noise and fight and this and that, and that's the old IMF. But we just took a different position. We went to them. We said, look, this is what we can do. But it didn't only the government telling you that. It was the private sector, the, credit, the, the labor movement, and civil society. Because when we met, we met with them as one. Every month, without anything to do with me, there's a BERT monitoring committee. Government don't have a soul on that. So they're free to say, a, B, C, X, Y, Z. Good, bad, indifferent. And those systems are there to help us stay solid. I drop dead tomorrow, you got the framework. Government change, God forbid, you got the framework. You understand? But that is the path that we have to take now, rather than the one that we took before. And let me give you why we're spending money on capital works. Last point. Last government had a recession 2008 to 2009. No doubt about that. But what they did was that they just spent money on hiring people open-ended. Now when you do that, you're spending more and earning less. Your deficits are getting wider Instead of it being a surplus, minus 7, minus 10%, one year I think we went as much as minus 11 or 12%. They tell you in the European Union and others that your deficit shouldn't be more than minus 3%. So for the whole time, it was more. We said then that what the government should be doing is spending its money in capital projects. Why? A capital project got a beginning and an ending. Whereas when you hire somebody open-ended, the liability is for until they retire. And that is the difference as to why you see us going for capital projects rather than simply just hiring people and pulling them on. Because the country can't sustain it. 
but in the capital projects, we can make sure that people are working and living. And in any event, once the private sector starts to start back up and step back up, small, medium, or large, then other work and other jobs will come. So I hope that we've explained in some measure the rationale and the motivation behind what we're doing. It's not rocket science. It's not a state secret. But everybody needs to be on board because, believe you me, this country has a long way to go. I'll say one last thing. You know what half our problem is? That we are simply do not have enough people coming to work every day in the country to produce. Now, there's a National Population Commission report. I think we've shared it with the Social Partnership already and others, and we're going to get into that conversation in a few weeks' time. But Barbados has not replaced its population since 1980. So if we were simply replacing our population, we would have 360,000 people now. We have 280. And with 360,000, that means what? More people producing, more people earning, more people paying, so that you have a stronger foundation from which to support the quality of life in the country. And we have to decide how we're going to do it. Now is not the time, but there are countries across the world, like Canada, like the UAE, like others who have done it, and manage migration, because we, we want to decide who we want to. We just don't want to be able to open up for the sake of opening up. So these are the things that will make a difference to your quality of life and to the country's stability in the medium to long term. Oh, colleagues, we have passed our time. One last question. Edwin, I don't mind taking two or three more because the truth is we started a little late and we had prayers and everything, so. I, I, I will defer. Uh, would you entertain a Zoom? Yes. Thank, thank you. This, this question, Dr. Greenwich, is, is really more of a request. You're being asked if it's possible that you can provide a worked example of the percentage applicable for an employee who receives allowances um, anytime during the, the six meeting slots. No, but this is on the base. Allowances are all excluded. Your travel, there's just a base salary. Okay. Um, so this is not allowances. Okay. So you really look at your base salary minus your statutory entitled um, deductions such as NAS and taxes. And but we, we accept that there may be some people who may want to go more than what they would like. If they do, they need to let us know and then we will tell you how much we can accommodate or not. Because there's some people who are already telling me that you got me down for 10%, but I want to take up 15%. Okay? So mm -hmm. people need to say so that we can go through and clarify and see what we can accommodate. And the, the last one I have um, relates to whether you can renew the bonds after maturity. No. Once you get a bond, then hopefully you have other... You see, the beautiful thing of this also, that it helps to develop the secondary market, where persons get familiar with trading bonds, etc. And hopefully by that time, the second market will be such that there will be other instruments, other things coming up that you can then put your money into. And it's also the idea that the Prime Minister floated where the, perhaps the credit unions can get together and maybe you have some sort of instrument to put your, save, your interest into, and then you have this money coming, you can put that in. So we have to work on those things. But it's finite. At the end of four years, you get your money. Thank you. Can you ask me something just now? Yes, thank you, Prime Minister. Now, I'd, before we close the session, I think that it would be prudent of me to say how the NUPW and the other unions would have come to the comfortable state that we are currently in. Now, this plan would have gone through many reiterations. The, at the beginning, it started with the four savings, and I don't I would try not to be repetitive. But we are at a point now where it is called the Barbados Optional Savings Scheme. And the word optional is very important to us because, as my sister said, who asked the question earlier, we wanted to, in, there must be an option for public servants to be able to participate 
or not, simply because we understood at the time that some public servants simply could not afford it. And we wanted to have that guarantee at the end of the day for those public servants who could not afford it, that they will be able to receive their money, all of their money, at the end of the month on time. And the NUPW and the unions were at that point, and that, to my mind, was the sticking point of this plan. Now, we have presented this plan to all of our internal organs within the NUPW. I think some of the unions are still going through that process. And we can say at this point that we are comfortable with where the plan is at. Are there any responses? Um, protective services, you have been first up because of your peculiar and special circumstances. I wouldn't want you to miss an opportunity to pose questions or comments or discussion or contribute to the discussion um, with you all being here and as wide a representative body as the president assures me could have mustered in this thing. Any questions? Any further comments? Just want to say I'm not speaking totally on behalf of the protective services, but as an individual, uh, it's been pretty clear. I supported it before he came here, and I will say that I support it, and um, I, I hope that all, all the other protective services will support it as well. It's very good. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really want to salute Barbadian ingenuity and Barbadian patriotism, and you know, Sometimes water will come to my eyes because I feel proud to be a Barbadian and to lead a country that is rooted in the way in which we are rooted. And the, the Lord never promised us a sunny day every day, but he promised us the capacity to be able to meander through this life with faith and with capacity and discipline. And I say this as I end here, that it is, what is it that we are required to do in the next 18 months? To come back fitter and stronger and better. And if we have to do that by reinforcing in each other and in our children the need for confidence, because anytime anything taken long, or anytime somebody don't know what they're doing, they're lacking in confidence usually. And they can normally solve that problem by asking a question. Correct? There's no, there's no, what's the word I'm looking for? There is no shame in saying I need to know. I say I need to know or I want to know every day. And that don't make me any less or better than anybody else. Two. So confidence, we also need to be creative. This is an example of Barbadian creativity at its best. And long may it stand in the annals of our history to inspire future generations. We also need to be committed. We are showing our commitment to each other and to the country. And finally, we need to be compassionate. We are showing that we care. And that's what compassion ultimately is about. So in this exercise, the four C's that I want us to leave our children with, not just in schools, but home at you, your nephews, your nieces, your grandchildren, confidence, commitment, creativity, compassion. And we do that, and we're gonna stay ahead of the curve, believe you me. And I speak now not just as Barbados, but with somebody who has a sense of what other countries are fearing. And we ain't doing too badly. We ain't doing as we would like, but we're doing a lot better than most. So thank you for coming. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for asking the questions. And let us together agree that we can do what is required of us to keep Barbados and Barbadians safe during this once-in-a-lifetime 
event and pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister, and I invite the co-chair to make some closing remarks as we move to the adjournment of this session. Thank you. I would only encourage us to having heard and having understood to share with our brothers and sisters to um, help clarify some of the issues that they would have and to encourage you all to have a beautiful rest of your month, Tuesday, almost a Monday. So that's it. Thank you. We are now adjourned.